Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the online service of the West Side Church of Christ. We normally meet at 2255 Totten Road. In fact, we did meet there earlier this morning at 1015. We're glad that you have chosen to be with us. We're hoping that this beginning of your week is a, a, a beginning of, of blessings received from God. And we're glad that you have chosen to spend a few minutes with us out of your schedule, uh, praising God, listening to a portion of God's word together. And if you are able to, to partake of the Lord's Supper together, if you just have a little piece of bread and some grape juice or or, or wine, we'd be happy to share that with you near the end of the service. Anyways, we're glad that you have chosen to be with us. We hope that you're finding today to be a blessing, and we're going to give people a few minutes to join us, but you can sing along with these well-known songs, or maybe just allow the melody and the harmony to guide the meditation of your heart this morning. Again, God bless for you joining us here today. Above all powers, above all kings, above all and all created things above all wisdom and all the ways of man you were here before the world began above all kingdoms above all thrones above all wonders the world has ever
He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand He leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by Thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, He leadeth me, by His own hand He leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by His hand He leadeth me. Again, we thank you so much for joining us today, and we're praying that this day is going to be a day of blessing, and it's a, it's a way that we uh, didn't have even like 50 years ago, is it, that we could meet like this and worship and honor our God and uh, celebrate the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. And that's really uh, one of the things that we hope we do in every day of our lives as Christians is to celebrate the victory, that we go through life knowing that we are more than victors through him who loved us, more than conquerors. If you follow along in your Bibles at home, I would appreciate it if you would turn to Exodus chapter 3. That's where we're going to begin. We're going to read actually Exodus chapter 3, the first 12 verses, well-known story in the Bible, uh, God's calling of Moses. But Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. If you don't uh, follow along in your Bibles, that's okay, and I hope that you'll, uh, I'll be clear enough in my reading. <clears throat> It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, But I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. There are a few stories that compare with God's calling of Moses to leave his life of exile and return to Egypt, now not as an Egyptian prince, which he grew up as, if you remember, but as the liberator of Israel, an Israelite liberator. Moses, as we see, is tending the flock of his father-in-law when a strange and mysterious sight takes hold of his attention. There is a bush that is burning, but the fire is not acting like fire normally acts. Fire is not consuming the bush. The Lord speaks to Moses. He calls his name, Moses, Moses, and Moses responds, Here I am. It's holy ground, and shoes must be removed, and then it is that God presents himself. I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God tells Moses that he has seen what Moses knows, the afflictions of his people. Moses knows his people are afflicted. Moses knows his fellow Israelites. 
are living the life of the cruelly oppressed. And God tells Moses that he knows. Now, if you consider the situation, especially what we've been talking about, that he won't give you more than you can handle, but there are definitely moments that are more than we can handle and we need to rely on God because we can't handle them. Considering the situation, the most powerful empire in the world, and you have a close-up view of this, is holding a nation of people as slaves. And you could ask the question quite seriously, who can possibly do anything about this? This is too much for one individual to handle. What can Moses do? He could protest the situation, but what really can he do? And actually, the one who can handle it now tells Moses, I will handle it. Remember, he says in verse 8, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them out of that land into a land flowing with milk and honey. I've done, I'm doing this, Moses. I've come down to do this. And the one who can handle it, the one who can handle it, is telling Moses he's going to do it. But now it's time for the big reveal. He says in verse 10, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And this leads to tension. Tension between Moses and God. Because in verse 11, Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Like, really, who am I? Who am I that I should do this? Who am I? I mean, look at them. Look at how powerful he, Who am I? And the tension comes back and forth here. And in verse 12, God says, but I will be with you, Moses. But I will be with you. See, Moses, you're right. Who am I? Yeah, you alone. You're nobody. But I'll be with you, Moses. And so we've been looking at that popular phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. And one of the dangers with popular phrases is that they become so spoken so often that they become internalized and just assumed to be 100% true. And everyone seems to think they know what it's saying or what they're talking about. But as we looked at last week, there's, there's a problem that you place God as the giver and you as the one who has the strength to handle. And so God's only role is giving you something. And, and kind of like, you know, having the confidence in you that you can handle this. But what happens when we find ourselves in situations that we can't handle them? What do we do now? And first of all, it's not always God who's giving us the situation. But second of all, it's God who is bringing us out of the situation. We can't handle it, but he can and instead of God won't give you more than you can handle, the, the better statement is there's nothing that you find that you can't handle that you can't go to God for help with. That's a better statement, isn't it? And it speaks more truth. And so we don't have to get down on ourselves when we find ourselves overwhelmed by situations. We might be overwhelmed, but God will not be. We might not be able to handle it, but God can. This is the important truth that we have to remember. As we have seen so far from Paul's teaching the last two weeks, number one, when it comes to temptations to sin, we're never going to be tempted beyond our ability, but God is not the giver. But he promises to limit the strength of the temptation, and he gives us a way of escape. God is part of the solution, not a part of the problem. He's not simply sitting back, testing us, watching, waiting to see if we pass or fail. That's not what's happening. When it comes to difficulties of life or afflictions or struggles, we can have situations that are too much for us. This is the truth. They're, they're beyond our strength. They're beyond our ability. And it's not necessarily that God has given us this. 
And it's not the truth that the strength is within us. But God is the one, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, God is the one we can rely on for deliverance. But we want to focus on something different this week because it goes along still with what we've been going through, what we've been dealing with, is what happens when we find ourselves in areas of life, especially callings from God, that we feel we just don't measure up. We feel we're just inadequate. And maybe we are inadequate, that we just don't measure up. And what do we do now if we, if we don't measure up, if we're not adequate, if we're insufficient to the task? And this is challenging because sometimes we can look at other people and maybe think, well, they have it. They're competent. Uh, they're sufficient. They're adequate. And it makes us even feel more inadequate. Um, we're going to find out a truth, first of all. There are certain callings from God that no matter how people present themselves, nobody is adequate. Nobody is sufficient. Nobody is competent. So God comes to Moses and he vows to deliver his people. And he's sending Moses. And Moses asked the question, legitimate question, who am I that I should go? And one of the biggest challenges we have in life at times is when we're faced with circumstances where we just don't have it in us to perform the task ahead of us. We just don't have it. We don't have the credentials. And Moses begins a conversation with God and this is the tension we're talking about here. And we want to watch the role of Moses and the role of God, because that's important here. If we're ever going to move forward with the most impossible task, we have to get this right. What is God's role so we can understand what our role is? We talked about that last week when we talk about afflictions or struggles in life. So first of all, you'll notice in verse 13, Moses comes up and he says, if I come to them... The God of your fathers has sent me. They're going to say, what is his name? What, what do I answer them? And God gives Moses the solution. He says, you say, I am who I am. Say, I am has sent you. Say this to the people of Israel, God says, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. That's what you're going to do. So, so Moses has questions. God has a solution. We're starting to see something here now, right? Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses comes up again and he says to God, but look, they're, they're not going to believe me, God. They're, they're going to say, the Lord never appeared to you. And so Moses has this, like, they're not going to believe me. And God says, Watch God's role again. What's in your hand? And Moses says, it's a staff. And he says, throw it on the ground. And Moses throws it on the ground. It becomes a serpent. And then God says, pick it up. And it becomes a staff again. And so you'll notice that Moses has this difficulty, but God has the solution. Now, Moses isn't turning the staff into a snake or the snake into a staff. It's God who's doing this. God is providing Moses with the solution. Moses comes to God again in verses 10 through 12, and he has another concern. He says, I'm not eloquent. I don't know how to speak. This role requires a speaker, and I just don't know how to speak. I'm slow of speech and of tongue. And God says, who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Go, and I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you shall speak. And so you see the, the inadequacy of Moses again. But God provides the solution. I'll be with your mouth and I'll tell you what to speak. Don't worry about that. I'm delivering them, Moses. I'm sending you, but I'm the one delivering them. I'm going to be with you. And finally, Moses just says in verse 13, Oh, Lord, please send someone else. And God gets angry. But he doesn't leave Moses empty hand. He says, Is not Aaron your brother the Levite? I know he can speak well, and he's coming to meet you. And you notice how God's providing Moses uh, a partner, his brother, a spokesman, and all these different things, and God comes up with the solution. Moses, you can't do this, but I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to give you all the tools necessary. I'm going to give you the power necessary. So we notice the order of things, don't we, that God is doing the delivering, and Moses is simply doing the obeying, or in other way, or ways, Moses is simply showing up. 
but God's doing the delivery. So when we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and remember in chapter 1, Paul spoke about being overwhelmed with the afflictions of life, but that, that was meant to teach Paul and the rest of them to rely on the, uh, uh, on the God who raised the dead. And so now we get into chapter 2 near the end there, and if you'll notice beginning at verse 14, Paul presents with a very uh, poetical or romantic sounding uh, passage. He, he, he says in, in verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God. And it sounds so romantic, this idea, right? That we are the aroma of Christ. Um, and when you think about this, I want you to think how amazing the sense of smell is. Because think about when um, you're asked, what does that smell remind you of? And maybe it's a familiar smell uh, from your long gone past. And just smelling, maybe it's uh, like smells like grandma's fresh baked bread or something. Just the sense of smell can take us back to specific places and things. It's, it's amazing, right? That, that sense of smell. And Paul speaks poeti poetically here, like we are the aroma of Christ. But Notice the words. It's not so romantic an idea that Paul brings up here. Notice verse 16. To one, we are a fragrance from death to death, and to the other, a fragrance from life to life. We are the smell of death and the smell of life. And in the latter part of chapter 2, beginning at verse 14, there's so much imagery and connections that Paul makes in this text. He begins by declaring in verse 14 that God is to be thanked because he's always leading us in Christ in triumphal procession. And this goes back to Roman days when a Roman leader would win a battle and he would lead, he would come back home to his hometown or to Rome and, and there would be this great triumphant procession where people would be out on the streets and he would be leading his army and they would be leading their prisoners right? And the prisoners would be paraded through the streets and the, the, the leading, uh, the, the victorious leader would also show the bounty that was plundered. And, and so Paul says, this is what's happening. And, and he's leading us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. And so as we follow Jesus, we're spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus everywhere. Whether it's Saturday night, Sunday morning, Monday at work, we're spreading the fragrance everywhere. Why? Because everywhere needs to smell that fragrance. But then he says, and this is important in verse 15 and 16, for those who are grasped by the love and power of the gospel, the smell is sweet. It's a fragrance from life to life. But for those who are opposed, the smell is a reminder of their own death. Because God has won the victory through Christ. He's won. And for those who are opposed to the gospel, it's a smell of death. And now Paul asks a question in verse 16. He takes his focus off of God for a moment. Thanks be to God who's always leading us in triumphal procession in Christ. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are dying. To those who are being saved a fragrance from life to life. To those who are dying, a fragrance from death to death. And then Paul asks a question, a really important question. Who is sufficient for these things? Who's sufficient for this? Who can rise to this challenge? Who has the credentials? And the answer, of course, 
is nobody is. Nobody is adequate. Nobody is competent. Nobody is sufficient. He goes into chapter 3, and you'll notice in verse 1 that he and his company are accused of commend, commending their, themselves. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, he says. That they're being accused of this, that they commend themselves. And, 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 and Paul asks, but do we need credentials? Do we need letters of recommendation that so many others seem to? Do we need letters of recommendation? You know, credential, credentialism is the idea that some paper qualification is above every other way of understanding human ability. That as long as you had a paper that says you had the credentials, it didn't matter how good a carpenter someone else was, if you had the credentials... And that's what's happening with Paul. And this kind of affects Paul, this, this accusation, because he brings it up a number of times in this letter. The people are suggesting he doesn't have the credentials, or he only recommends himself. One example, for instance, is later on in chapter 10. He says in verse 12, Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves. We don't do that. But when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. People who commend themselves and compare themselves with other people, they don't have proper understanding. He says in verse 17, Let the one who boasts boast only in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. That's, that's all that matters. The point Paul is making is very clear in chapter 3. For notice he says in verse 4, this is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. We are confident, but we're not sufficient. We're confident, but we're not competent. We're confident, but we're not adequate. For notice what he says in verse 5, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. But our sufficiency, our competency, our adequacy is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Nobody is sufficient or adequate or competent. None of us are. Like Moses, there, there is none of us who can do the act of liberating. Like Moses, competency and sufficiency and adequacy is not within us. And so we don't have to feel bad that we don't have the credentials. It's not something we can handle. But our competency, our sufficiency comes from God. If we show up, it'll be sufficient. We'll be competent. We'll be made competent by God. And so if you're ever looking at this job of being a Christian in a world as being something that you don't know if you can do it, you don't know if you've got the goods, you don't know if you can handle, if you have the qualifications, the good news is none of us do. None of us ever have. Our competency, our adequacy comes from God. Just show up. Be faithful to him. Be faithful to him and you'll be just right to be in any situation where you spread the sweet-smelling fragrance of the knowledge of him. Just show up. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord thou hast taught me to say, it is well.
our prayer for all of us that it's well with our soul right we all have times where we feel like we're just not measuring up and maybe we just don't have uh, the capabilities that other people have or we wish that we had and the truth is is that maybe we don't Um, but God makes us capable God makes us sufficient Every first day of the week in Churches of Christ, we follow the example of the early church and uh, make the centerpiece of our service together, the Lord's Supper, where we think about the and remember and honor the great victory Jesus won on the cross by submitting himself to the forces of death and dying and then rising again and being victorious for all eternity over death, hell, and the grave and ushering in eternal life for all of us. And so this is the reason we are able to have confidence in God. This is the reason we're able to be called children of God is because of what Jesus accomplished for us uh, through his death and resurrection. Isaiah the prophet spoke about a coming servant of God who would suffer for on behalf of everybody else. He says in Isaiah 53 and verse 3 that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded For our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so when we consider Jesus dying on the cross and the suffering that he went through, I think it's important for us to remember that all of our sins were laid on him. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And today we live forgiven and free and redeemed because of what Jesus did so long ago. Bow with me for the bread, please. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, that your son Jesus came and he was willing to give up his life on the cross and his body was broken for us. Bless this bread, as through Christ's name we pray, amen. And bow with me for the fruit of the vine. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, that Jesus' blood was shed and we could be cleansed and washed thoroughly through that blood. It is through Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Again, we thank you for joining us. We're hoping that you're finding uh, this time to be a blessing. If you have any uh, concerns, prayer requests, or questions, we would love to hear from you. You can email me at westsidewindsorcoc at gmail.com, or you can phone me at 519-995-4189. My name is Drew. I'd be happy to talk to you. And if you would ever like to join us at the Westside Church for a live service, we'd be more than happy to have you. Right now we're meeting at 1015 Sunday mornings, and we'd, be, we'd love to see you there. Um, hoping that your week will be great. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, bow with me for one final word of prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, that you make us competent, Father. Father, we feel so weak and inadequate at times, but that's just... Um, just our own self-perception for we know father that our strength comes from you we know we when we rely on you father we have everything we need for the through christ's name we pray amen god bless everyone